Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Threats to species. The threat factors can be discerned from ecology. And in the last lecture, we had seen that there are a number of push and pull factors that decide or determine whether an organism will be found in a particular place or not. So, the uh, pull factors, as you'll remember, are those factors that attract organisms to them. So they could include things like uh, a good climate, a good soil, ample amount of food, and so on. Whereas push factors are those factors that push the organisms away from them. And they include things like uh, a climate that is very hot or very cold or very dry. So areas that do not have a good amount of food available for them or areas that have predators or diseases so these are the areas where these factors would be pushing the species away from these areas. So any organism that is found in these areas, there's a very good chance that either this organism will uh, be killed or this organism will shift to some other place. So there are certain push factors and certain pull factors. Now, when we talk about the threat factors, then if an organism is a threat, what does it mean? It means that the organism is facing push factors everywhere and it does not have a pull factor anywhere. Which means that from all the areas, this organism is being pushed out and there is no place where this organism is finding a habitat that is suitable for itself. So the threat factors listen from ecology are that uh, you have push factors everywhere and pull factors nowhere and that would be a major threat to any wildlife species. And if you look at these push factors, we can divide them into certain categories. So the first one is no suitable habitat. So you have um, an area which does not provide a suitable habitat to the species. It is either too hot or too cold, or there are no trees, so there is no shelter that is available for the organism. There are no food, there are no nutrients in this area or an area that is completely burnt up. So probably there was a forest fire and this forest fire burnt away all the habitats of a particular species. So in that case, this organism will not be having any other suitable habitat in which to live. Or areas that are rich in noxious factors that is too polluted. So for instance, there is a species that is found in a particular lake and this lake is now being used as a dump site for industrial activities. So when that happens, the organisms will lose out their habitat. Or areas that are not suited behaviorally because of habitat selection. So probably an organism could have thrived in an area, but then this place is all full of such trees that its habitat selection does not permit to use or to prefer as a habitat. So these are push factors that are related to the habitat. Then there are certain other push factors that are related to competition. Probably the habitat of the organism is now full of invasive species. So invasive species are those species that when they come into a habitat, they grow so profusely and they outcompete the native species to such an extent that in a very short period of time, you will only find these invasive species that are predominating these areas. So if an area has invasive species, then probably the habitat will go back. Or areas that have too many predators or diseases. So the organism could have lived there, but now there are so many predators in that area that any organism that remains in this area might get killed off. Or there are a number of diseases in those areas. So there could be a competition because of invasive species, because of predators and so on. So these are other push factors. 
or you could have the push factors of being killed out especially to, by human beings say due to heavy poaching so for organisms such as tigers this is a major threat then we also have other push factors in the form of small population dynamics now small population dynamics act when the population has already become very small and these include things such as ele effect or stochastic deaths now ele effect is a, an effect that occurs when the population size has gone down now in the case of a number of species the size of the population plays a very important role in how efficient this population and the individuals of the population are so for instance if we consider a pack of wolves if there is a single wolf it might not be able to uh, kill the prey so it requires a certain small number of wolves that should be there so that the prey is killed effectively and all the uh, individuals in the pack are able to get their food now if the pack size reduces to such an extent that you only have a few wolves so these wolves will, will not be able to hunt in an efficient manner and in that case this would start acting as a push factor for this small pack of wolves so this is known as the ele effect or you could have stochastic deaths so stochastic deaths means that you have um, a random death that is occurring in this area and it is just possible that that you already have a very small population say around four individuals and these four individuals die off or three out of these four individuals die off so this would not have had a big impact if the population size was large in a pack of say uh, 40 wolves if three individuals died it would not have mattered much but in a pack of four wolves if three individuals die off the lone individual will not be able to breed any further and this pack will is as good as gone so these are the impacts that occur when the population size is very small and these are known as small population dynamics so these are all different threat factors that we can discern from the ecology of different species so there could be the push factor of an unsuitable habitat everywhere or there could be a biological factor that uh, these uh, uh, individuals are getting completed out because of invasive species because of predators or humans could be involved in killing out uh, the individuals of the population or they could be the small population dynamics because of which uh, there is a big threat to the uh, small populations now when we talk about these push factors these push factors can be divided into two categories there are factors that push a population towards smaller number so here the population is currently large in size and these are the factors that are pushing the population towards a smaller number and these are known as declining population paradigm so declining population paradigm is the study of those factors that push a population a large size population towards a smaller numbers and this occurs through population dynamics on the other hand we also have the small population paradigm which occurs due to factors that push a small population towards extinction so in the case of the declining population paradigm you have a large population and the declining population paradigm is converting a large population to a smaller population whereas in the case of a small population paradigm we are talking about a small population that is now being eliminated so these the small population paradigm comprises of factors that push a small population towards extinction so we can categorize our uh, push factors into the declining population paradigm cause of smallness such as things like no suitable habitat so if the habitat is becoming uh, unsuitable probably because it is uh, because of say climate change so if climate change is occurring in an area then it is possible that the habitats become too hot or they become too dry or too wet and when such a scenario occurs then it is possible that the large size populations 
will now be pushed towards small desk because they are now now not getting sufficient food they are not getting sufficient uh, suitable habitats in which to thrive or we can have this competition so competition also pushes a large population to a small size population or poaching now poaching uh, um, or uh, a heavy poaching generally reduces a large size population into a smaller one and in the case of the small factor paradigm we can consider these small population dynamics such as le effect and the stochastic deaths now when we talk about any population and a population is comprised of uh, individuals of the same species that are living in the same area and can potentially interbreed amongst each other so basically we are talking about a small cohesive group of individuals now if you consider any population there are two factors that are occurring at all times now these factors are the the deterministic factors and they are the stochastic factors now deterministic factors act at large population sizes and stochastic factors are more important when the population sizes are smaller so what are these factors the deterministic factors are the factors that act at large population sizes so these include things like birth rate death rate population structure and so on so basically if you have a population a large size population and the birth rate has gone down or say the death rate has gone up now why could such a thing happen probably there is um, some pathogen that is uh, affecting the uh, the breeding females because of which a spontaneous abortion occurs so that would reduce the birth rate in this population or probably there is an infection that is killing off the individuals because of which the death rate has increased now these sorts of factors the changes in birth rate and the changes in death rate they are important even when your population is large in size and so these are deterministic factors so things like birth rate death rate population structure suppose your population is now comprising of individuals that are very old so it is just a matter of time that the population will collapse because these very old individuals will not be able to breed so at all points of time you need to have a population structure that comprises of certain young individuals a number of mature individuals and some old individuals and the population structure should also be such that you have roughly equal number of males and females now if you do not have a suitable population structure then even though if you have a small uh, a large size population it is po uh, possible that the population might be pushed towards smallness and so this is a deterministic factor on the other hand the stochastic factors which are more important when the population sizes are small comprise of things like demographic stochasticity now demography is uh, de uh, demographic stochasticity includes occurrence of probabilistic events such as reproduction litter size sex determination and death now what do we mean by uh, demographic stochasticity suppose you have a large size population suppose you have 1000 individuals and in this population you have 500 new young ones that have uh, been born in this particular year now generally uh, the sex ratio is close to 1 is to 1 so you have uh, out of these 500 uh, uh, 500 young ones you have uh, uh, 250 males and 250 females now what happens if by chance it happens that more number of males are born so in place of having 250 males suppose you have 300 males and you only have 200 females will that make a very big difference to this population probably not what about if you had say 400 males and 100 females well it might have certain influence but again this is just a chance factor it is possible that in the next litter you will have more number of females so it does not matter much when we consider a large size population but now consider a small population so you have a small population that is comprised of only 3 individuals and these uh, and uh, you have uh, one breeding pair in these 3 individuals which have given rise to a litter 
and it so turns out that the litter comprises of say two males so in the parent generation you had two males and one female and in the next generation you again come up with two males now this is a random phenomenon so it can occur in any population but in the case of larger size populations some deviation would have been uh, quite acceptable but in this small population it so happens that the uh, females have gone down in numbers so fast that now you do not have sufficient females for this population to continue so demographic stochasticity plays a very important role in the case of small populations and so this is a stochastic factor another stochastic factor is environmental variation and fluctuations now the environment and the weather of any place is variable and it might so happen that in a particular year it turns out to be a drought like situation now in a drought like situation if you have a large size population a number of individuals would die off so probably you started with say uh, 1000 individuals and out of those 1000 individuals 500 individuals perish in the drought so this could happen but the 500 individuals that remain will be quite sufficient to to uh, to take this population back to its original state so probably in the next year when it rains uh, uh, better then the population will be able to jump back to its original state but now consider a very small size population suppose you only started with a, a population that comprised of say five individuals now in these five individuals suppose three or four individuals perish in the drought so the one or two that remain might not be sufficient to take this population back to the normal state which is why the environmental variation and fluctuations are also stochastic factors that are very important when the population sizes are small then we have catastrophic factors such as forest fires and diseases these are also much more important when we talk about smaller populations because we are talking about um, the 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 perishing of a, a large number of individuals from the smaller populations so this would uh, push these small populations to such small states that probably the population will not be able to come back to its original state other stochastic factors include genetic processes such as loss of heterogeneity and inbreeding depression now what we mean here is that in the case of a small population it is possible that all the individuals that are there in the population are related to each other and in that case when a breeding happens between these individuals it is possible that you have breeding between brothers and sisters or you have breeding between parents and children when that happens the uh, the recessive alleles that are there in the individuals they get a chance to express themselves and in such scenarios we will find a number of recessive disorders that come up into these populations so you will, we will start seeing diseases which are recessive diseases which would not have expressed themselves had this population size been larger and had uh, these breedings occurred between individuals that were not related to each other but now because the population size is small so there is a much greater chance that inbreeding depression occurs and that would be a genetic process that is leading to uh, extinction uh, because of the stochasticity involved or we have things like deterministic processes such as density dependent mortality on exceeding the carrying capacity of the habitat now these processes what we are talking about here is the density dependent mortality now in a number of uh, in a number of species it has been observed that as the the population density increases the rate of mortality increases because you have a large number of individuals that are there in a very small area and there are very continuous contacts between individuals there is much greater aggression much greater competition and diseases can also spread in a much quicker manner now if we talk about a small population which is comprised in a small area then even though your population size is small but the population density is very large because of which we will start seeing density dependent mortality 
and this is again a stochastic factor that becomes much more important when the population sizes are smaller when the population sizes are larger then de then density dependent mortality is a mechanism by which the population size is getting controlled so when the population increases very much then a number of individuals die off and the population comes back to the level of carrying capacity of the habitat so that is okay when the population sizes are large but when the population sizes are small then it becomes a very important factor that can push the population towards extinction then we also have the factor of migration among the populations now we have seen in an earlier lecture what migration is so migration is the movement of individuals from one place to another typically it is a seasonal movement and typically it occurs along fixed routes now if it so happens that in a population you have say four individuals and out of these four individuals there is one female and this female migrates out so the three males that remain in this area will not find a partner to breed and in that case this uh, this is a small population will turn towards extinction it's a very similar manner if you have three females and one male and the male goes on so such factors become very important when the population sizes are small if the population sizes were large say in a group of 1000 individuals say 10 or 20 or 100 individuals move out during a migration period it's fine it does not make much of a difference but in the case of smaller populations if it so happens that members of a particular sex move out then it is possible that the remaining members will not find partners and the population will be pushed towards extinction now the factors that drives a species towards extinction can very easily be remembered using this acronym hippo now the first h uh, refers to habitat loss so the habitat is getting lost and if the uh, if, a, if if a particular species don't, does not have suitable habitat it will not have a place to live and this factor will lead or push the species towards extinction i refers to invasive species so invasive species if they uh, come to the habitat of uh, your species of interest and uh, they can lead to uh, the degradation or loss of the habitat next is pollution so pollution re reduces the quality of the habitat because of which it is unable to support a large number of individuals the next p is human overpopulation now these days humans are the most important factor when we uh, consider the extinction of species so more the number of humans in an area more is the impact of these humans because more number of humans more amount of affluence it would mean that more amount of pollutants are being released into the environment more and more amount of resources are being taken from the environment in a number of cases we have seen that uh, in a forest if there is a, a small pond and this pond would have met the requirements of the wild animals now if a village comes up in the vicinity then these humans start competing with these wild animals for water and in most of the cases the wild animals will be out competed by the humans and slowly Uh, their population sizes will go down the next o is over harvesting over harvesting is harvesting beyond the capacity of a system so in a number of cases we have seen that uh, in a forest if you have a species that is uh, commercially important say you have uh, a shrub or a herb that has medicinal properties so if humans were to extract this herb or shrub in a sustainable manner what they would have done is that they would take out some individuals and let others remain so that the next generation comes up but then in the case of over harvesting what happens is there would be a few greedy people who would get inside remove all the individuals of this herb or shrub species and then no, not a single individual is left in that area and the population de uh, declines or collapses so the factors that drive a species towards extinction are these five factors the loss of habitat invasive species that have come into the habitat pollution human overpopulation and over harvesting now the impact of humans on different species is different so the sensitivity of a species to human impacts is dependent upon a number of factors 
such as the adaptability and resilience of the species so there are certain species that give uh, that produce a large number of offspring so even if humans are uh, are taking out individuals from uh, this species the individuals that remain they breed so profusely that it hardly matters good examples are things like mosquitoes or things like uh, rats and mice now humans have been trying to exterminate mosquitoes for quite a long long, long period of time but what happens is that every uh, uh, every female mosquito lays hundreds of eggs and so even if a few individuals survive they are sufficient to bring the mosquito population back to its original state so this is an example of a resilient species on the other hand there are certain species such as elephants now elephants have a very long gestation period elephants do not produce a large number of offsprings typically in a uh, birth you will only have a single calf that is produced and they also have a very long period of sexual maturity so now if humans remove a few elephants from the population the population will not be able to come back so the impact of humans on a species would depend on how resilient the species is rats and mosquitoes that is very resilient or is it a species like elephants that is not resilient so adaptability and resilience of the species has a very important bearing on the impact of humans on that species next we have human attention so there are certain charismatic species such as tigers which are more sensitive because humans have a high demand for their skin for their bones and their other body parts so if humans pay a lot of attention if humans find that a certain species is beautiful or it is charismatic or it is majestic then that species will have a much greater impact of human beings so there is a much greater danger if the species is beautiful like peacocks if it is majestic like tigers and humans are given attention to that species so that is a big problem next we have ecological overlap between humans and the species the greater the overlap the greater the impact now a good example is those species that live in the plain areas now and especially the grasslands now humans have converted a, a large number of grasslands into agricultural fields so those species that lived in those grasslands were much greater affected than those species that lived in say the deserts because there is a very less ecological overlap between the activities of humans in the desert and the activities of those wild animals in the desert because humans typically avoid going to the desert that is not a very good place to uh, for humans whereas in the case of grasslands because humans find so many uses because it is a flat land it has soil and the land is also um, uh, rich in uh, nutrients so it is very easy to convert these grasslands into agricultural crops so the impact of humans because of this Uh, ecological overlap on the species that live in the grasslands will be very high next we have the home range requirements of the species the species that have larger home ranges are more sensitive to human impacts why to take an example let us consider elephants now elephants require hundreds of square kilometers of area for a small population now if humans say dissect this area into two small parcels parcel a will not be able to hold an elephant population and parcel b will also not be able to hold the elephant population and the elephant population will slowly get wiped out whereas if you had a species that requires a very small area again to take an example let us consider rats now rats require a few square meters of area or say a a, a few hundreds of square meters of area now even in these two patches this patch can support a rat population this patch can support a rat population so the rat population will be able to thrive but the elephant population will uh, go into a decline because elephants have the larger home range requirements they cannot live in smaller areas but then is this threat real or is this threat imaginary and what is the rate at which we are losing out the species 
to we can make an estimate by using the principles of biogeography and especially the island biogeography model now the island biogeography model says that the species richness is dependent on the area so if you uh, consider an island and if you have a small sized island it will have smaller number of uh, species if you have a larger sized island it will probably support a larger number of species now the uh, the richness of uh, the species in this island will be dependent on the area of the island but it, will, it is not directly proportional it is proportional to some power of the area and we call that as z so we can write it as s is equal to c into a to the power z where c and z are constants now it has been found that z varies between 0.15 and 0.35 now taking a middle value 0.3 for an area a1 you will have s1 is equal to c into a1 to the power of z which is 0.3 which is telling us that the species richness in this area of uh, size a1 is this much now even if the area decreases by as much as 90% so you only have one tenth of the area left let us say that 90% of this island has been cleared off by human beings and only 10% of the area remains now how many individuals or how many species will be able to survive in this island with 90% of the area gone so if we write a2 as 0.1 into a1 we will have the species uh, richness now is c into a2 which is 0.1 into a1 to the power of 0.3 which means that if we take a ratio we will find that s2 by s1 is approximately 50% so which is telling us that even when the area has been reduced by 90% the species richness has only become half which means that out of the complete area of the island you have removed the 90% only 10% remains but even in this 10% 50% of the species that were earlier there in the island they will find a representation only some uh, species that have larger home range requirements they would be extinct but now this is just an example if we consider what is the amount at which or what is the rate at which the areas are actually going down so let us consider the, the tropical forests now tropical forests are actually decreasing at the rate of 1.8 percent per annum so the rate is very small we are not uh, putting the area down by 90 percent we are only reducing it by 1.8 percent every year and let us consider the lowest value of z which is 0.15 now if you put both of these values into the equation you will find that there is an annual loss of 0.27 percent now an annual loss of 0.27 percent would look like a very small figure but then the estimated number of species in the tropical forest is as high as 10 million so we are having an annual loss of the species of 0.27% of 10 million which is 27000 species in a year so taking a very conservative estimate of the the lowest value of z we are finding that we are losing as many as 27000 species from the the tropical forest every year and this is only talking about the tropical forest because the impact of human beings is there on all different kinds of habitats we are all also seeing loss of habitats when we talk about temperate forests when we talk about subarctic forests when we talk about grasslands when we talk about the uh, uh, the wetlands when we talk about lacustrine areas when we talk about even the oceans because the oceans are also being dumped with so much of uh, chemicals and waste materials that they are also degrading in their habitat quality so just from the tropical forest we are getting a figure of 27000 species every year just consider how many species we are losing when we consider all the habitats together and this figure is every year so we are losing 27000 species every year and the sad part here is that we will not even know what species we are losing because we have not still 
documented all the species that are found in the tropical forest. We do not know how many species of frogs are there. We do not know how many species of snakes are there. We do not know how many species of lizards are there. We do not know how many species of plants are there. And this estimate is telling us that even before documentation, we are losing out a number of these species. So the, the threat to these individuals is actually very large. And the susceptibility of species to extinction varies. As we saw that when we are reducing the area of an island by as much as 90%, 50% of the species remain. So what are the 50% that get exterminated in priority and what are those 50% that remain in that area? So some species have a much greater chance of extinction primarily because they are rare. Rarity is a function of the ecology and the, and the evolutionary characteristics of the species. And the rarer a species is, it means that you already have a very small population. Probably it is localized in a very small area. And this rarity would mean that, this, the, that the small population paradigm would act very fast. And those small habitats where these organisms are found, if those habitats are lost, we will lose out these species. Now, why are certain species rare? There are three reasons. One, there is a habitat selection and evolutionary characteristics because of which a species is restricted to an uncommon habitat. Example is species that are found in desert springs. Now, in the deserts, you already have very less number of springs. So, a species that is localized to a spring that is found in the desert will automatically be very rare species or species with limited geographical range, such as those species that are found in a single lake. Now, it is possible that the individuals that are, or the species that are found in that lake, they are unable to move to some other lake because, because maybe these species cannot fly. So they have no means of moving to another lake. Or those species that have low population densities especially um, species such as uh, elephants because larger uh, animals require more space and so because, uh, the, uh, because the individuals are large in size, they require large areas and a mechanism to deal with it is that the, these uh, uh, species have low population densities. Now because this species has a low population density, it is a rare species. Now the impacts on the habitat or the push factors on the habitat can be, be accentuated by these four processes. We have the processes of habitat degradation, habitat fragmentation, habitat displacement, and habitat loss. And all four of these are different, but they have a very similar impact in reducing the habitat that is available for the uh, species. So let us look at these one by one. Habitat degradation is the process by which the habitat quality for a given species is diminished. So in the case of degradation, the habitat quality goes down. Now what do we mean by habitat quality? Suppose uh, consider a lake and earlier this lake was able to support say 1000 individuals. Now in this lake, we are dumping municipal waste and because of which the habitat quality has gone down. Now, in place of supporting 1000 individuals, now it can only support 800 individuals. Now, when such a thing happens, we'll say that the habitat has become degraded. The quality has gone down because of which this habitat is unable to support the large number of individuals and the large number of species that it was able to support beforehand. So it is the process by which habitat quality for a given species gets diminished. Some causal agents for habitat degradation include things like contamination, air pollution, water pollution, eutrophication, pesticides and accumulative toxins can all degrade the habitat. Now, eutrophication is the phenomenon in which fertilizers are able to reach into water bodies, primarily because these days we are using a large amount of fertilizers in our agricultural fields and when it rains, 
these fertilizers also get washed down together with the rain and they reach into the water bodies now what happens when you artificially increase the amount of nutrients that uh, that are made available in the water bodies so earlier consider there was a lake and this lake was a very good ecosystem it was supporting a large number of fishes now uh, fertilizers have entered into this lake together with the rain water now what happens these fertilizers will result in a very profuse and a very rapid growth of plants in this lake and these plants will in turn strangle the fishes and when these plants die off then uh, when their bodies get get decomposed then that would also result in uh, lowering of the oxygen levels that are there in the water at the same time when these plants are growing then they are also taking up space in that water and so the amount of space that is available to the fishes also goes down so all these processes eutrophication u is good trophication is the presence of nutrients so in the process of eutrophication you are putting a good amount of nutrients into the system which is having a negative impact on the habitat quality pesticides and accumulative toxins uh, so pesticides can also reach into the water bodies together with uh, the rain water and these pesticides can get accumulated in the bodies now this is an example of a eutrophied uh, state of a water body so this is potomac river and here we can see that there is such a profuse algal growth because uh, the uh, the amount of nutrients in this water body have gone up now when we say bioaccumulation what it means is that suppose we had sprayed an insecticide into Uh, the agricultural fields, and together with the wind, it has also reached into other areas. It has reached into grasslands. It has reached into the forest areas. Now, what happens? These grasses now also have certain amount of pesticide. The insects that live on these grasses or that feed on these grasses will also eat up pesticides when they are eating up the grasses. And these pesticides will in turn get accumulated or stored in the bodies of these insects primarily in the fat tissues so a number of pesticides are very easily stored in the fat tissues and uh, in the bodies of these organisms they will get uh, accumulated and this is known as bioaccumulation now what happens the the level of pesticides that was there in these grasses was very low but now because these insects have fat bodies in their body uh, in their bodies so now the pesticide is getting accumulated in the bodies now when uh, the next organism like frog when it eats these insects what happens is that the uh, the fat that was there in the bodies of these insects is now entering into the body of this frog now one frog will be eating a large number of insects and all of these pesticides that was uh, there in the bodies of so many insects a large proportion of it will get stored in the body of the frog so the concentration of pesticides in the grass was very less it was higher in the case of the insects because one single insect was feeding on a large number of grasses it is even more in the case of frogs because one frog is eating up so many insects then a snake it a large number of frogs and so the pesticides from the bodies of a large number of frogs will get accumulated in the body of the snake and as we move up the food chain we will find that the concentration of pesticides goes up and up and this is known as biomagnification so there is a bioaccumulation in the bodies and this accumulation goes on increasing as we move up the food chain and this is known as biomagnification a good example is the concentration of uh, ddt in uh, a lake ecosystem so when it was measured it was found that water had 0.01 parts per million of ddt the planktons which are small plants had 5 ppm so there is a large increase uh, around 500 times in the concentration of ddt that was present in water to what was present in the planktons then the fishes that eat these planktons had a concentration of 40 to 300 ppm and the fish eating birds had a concentration of 1600 to 2500 ppm now this is a very high concentration 
and it would have a very drastic impact on these birds and it was also found that a number of uh, these birds uh, their population was uh, declining very fast because uh, of the the presence of these pesticides they were not able to lay eggs with strong shells so this is an impact that occurs as we move up the food chain the concentration of the pesticides increases and it may increase to such an extent that it starts showing up a negative influence other causal agents of habitat degradation are trash so trash includes things like ghost nets now a ghost net is a net that was earlier used for fishing but then probably because of a storm it just drifted out into the sea or probably it had completed its uh, utility and so it was dumped into the sea and you have a number of animals that get trapped in these nets so these ghost nets keep on reducing animal numbers by trapping these animals and killing these animals or we have things like entanglement so here you have a seal and this seal is surrounded by this piece of plastic and this plastic is cutting into its body another example is this trash so we have uh, mukurti national park where we have nilgiri tars and if you go to this area you will also find certain trash that is there alongside the roads so this is having an impact of habitat degradation for the nilgiri tar we also find uh, that plastics have entered into uh, the areas of a, of a number of other wild animals such as hyenas other factors of habitat degradation include things like soil erosion now when soil erosion occurs the top layers of the soil get washed away or they get blown away and when that happens the amount of soil that remains in the habitat goes down when that happens a number of plants will may not be able to thrive in that area so this is also an example of habitat degradation another is fire regimes if you have a forest and there is a fire now because of this fire a large number of plants will die off a large number of animals will die off the amount of nutrients that are available in this ecosystem will go down so this is another example of habitat uh, degradation another causal factor is over exploitation of water which makes water less available for the species and deforestation now we have seen this example before if there is deforestation then that is also degrading the habitat and we are seeing deforestation in a large scale so this is an area in balaghat district of madhya pradesh in 2006 and this is the same area in 2018 and here we are seeing deforestation for mining operations this is a region in umaria district and i would like you to concentrate on this area so here we have a road and I'm, i would like you to concentrate on this area this is how it looks in 2018 so all of these forests are now gone and this is deforestation to expand agriculture here we have a region in bhopal district in 2003 and here is the same region in 2018 to make this nam so deforestation is occurring in a big way another causal agent of habitat degradation is desertification which is conversion of good areas into deserts primarily by overgrazing and through cultural practices so this is an image from gujarat and when all these goats eat up these vegetation then uh, this area will slowly and steadily convert into a desert other causal agents include draining dredging and damming operations in water bodies over exploitation of biota in which case humans go into the forest areas and extract these uh biotic resources out of these areas and introduction of exotic species now when habitat degradation occurs in such a large extent that the habitat quality goes down to an extreme then we call it a habitat loss habitat loss occurs when the quality of the habitat is so low that the habitat is no longer usable by a given species so this is the extreme form of habitat degradation then we also have habitat fragmentation fragmentation occurs when a natural uh, landscape is broken up into small parcels of natural ecosystems isolated from one another in a matrix of lands dominated by human activities it involves both loss and isolation of ecosystems 
So what we are saying here is that in place of a continuous large sized area, we had divided the area into very small parcels or pockets of land, pockets of habitat, and this is known as habitat fragmentation. So a large sized habitat is fragmented into smaller parcels. Now, habitat fragmentation is important because larger fragments typically support more number of species. Because larger fragments have both diverse environments, more habitats, they are more likely to have both common species and uncommon species. And also because the smaller fragments have smaller populations, so the chances of them getting extinct are greater. Because if you have smaller populations, then the small population dynamics also start acting on those small populations. So it is always beneficial that we should have habitats as big contiguous areas and not as small parcels. Now, how does habitat fragmentation occur? The causal agents include things like roads, railways, dams and other structures. And structures uh, such as these linear infrastructures of roads and railways they not only cause mortality, they act as a physical barrier because of which the animals are not able to cross them. They act as psychological barriers. So if you consider a road in which there is a heavy traffic, the animal, if it wants to cross to the other part of the habitat, it will not be able to, to do that because of the fear of getting hit by one of these vehicles. So either this animal gets hit or in certain cases, it is so afraid that it does not cross this area because it acts as a psychological barrier. Then these uh, uh, structures such as roads and railways also increase the access to human influence and they increase access to invasive species and exotic species. Other causal agents for habitat fragmentation include diversion of land for agriculture. So here we are seeing linear infrastructure in the form of pipelines. So if you have such pipelines, animals find it very difficult to cross from this area to this area. If you have a dam, an animal will not be able to cross just like this. It will have to either cross a very uh, long stretch or it will just not cross this area. So dam causes habitat fragmentation. Now the process of habitat fragmentation and loss occurs in a series of steps. So we'll uh, understand these steps through these illustrations. Let us consider that this is an original forest and you have a large number of trees here. Now the first step that occurs is dissection. Now in dissection, one or more linear infrastructures, primarily roads, are set up and these roads dissect this uh, complete forest into two or more smaller parcels. Now once this dissection has occurred, it, it is now easier for humans to come to these areas. And so we will start seeing small settlements. Now in these small settlements, people will start farming these areas or uh, raising some a certain livestock. And to make space for farming and for livestock, they will clear up certain portions of the forest. And this is the stage known as perforation. So now they are perforating into the forest. So this is how it will look like. These are livestock in the forest near uh, the Mudumalai tiger. Now after perforation, once you have uh, certain uh, human beings that are living there in the settlements, these settlements slowly grow. And why do they grow? Because they are right next to the door and any produce that these uh, farmers or these early settlers produce in the form of milk or say agricultural produce, it finds a ready market because people who are going through these roads will uh, buy their stocks. So slowly and steadily, the number of livestock will increase, the area under cultivation will increase, more and more number of buildings will come up. And in this process, it is now uh, converting this whole forest into smaller parcels. So this is one parcel, this is one parcel, this is one parcel, and this is one parcel. So we now have four small parcels. So this is habitat fragmentation that is happening. This is an example of habitat fragmentation. So these early settlers have now converted all of these areas into their agricultural or plantation areas and so the animals that were there in these forests are now unable to cross these areas and so this has become a small fragment. Now after fragmentation we will have the process of attrition. 
Now, in the process of attrition, these settlements grow to such a large extent that these pockets have now become very small areas. And during this process of attrition, we will also start seeing uh, electricity coming into this area or a small industries coming into this area or certain facilities such as schools and hospitals that are being built up because now these settlements are so large that now government is bound to provide them with certain facilities. And so with this process of attrition, we have very small parcels that are left. This is an example. So this was a beautiful hill that was covered with forest. But now through the process of attrition, we only have this small patch of forest that is left in this area. Now we can see an example through uh, the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest. So these are satellite images from 1975. And I would like you to pay an attention to this road. So this is uh, how the dissection occurred in this area. So this road was uh, constructed in this uh, pristine forest. Now, this is 1975, this is 1984. So by 1984, now people have started to enter into these areas and they have constructed a new road. So we did not have a road here, but now you see, uh, or you very clearly see that this stream has also been uh, converted into a passageway and now uh, deforestation is occurring in the form of this fishbone pattern. So this is 1984, 1985, 1986, 1987 and we see that slowly and steadily the forests are being converted and uh, the wood is being extracted out. 1996, 98, 2002, 2007, 13, 15, 16. And so what was there in the form of a pristine forest is now completely deforested. So what started with uh, a small amount of habitat degradation and habitat fragmentation ultimately resulted in the loss of the forest. So before we have a situation like this, a pristine forest, afterwards we hardly have any forests that are left in this area. And this is an example of an extremely fragmented habitat from Madhubalai. So this area is a part of the elephant corridor. So elephants traditionally use this area to move from one place to another place. But now with the settlements, we can see that these hills still have some forest left, but the rest of the place is now completely converted into a human dominated landscape. And in such landscapes, people set up fencing and because of that, animals are unable to cross into these landscapes and the hills that are left are so high that the elephant will not be able to uh, cross in, uh, through this landscape by going through the hills because it's a very massive animal. It has a weight of like 4,000 or 5,000 kgs and it takes, in, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to lift that uh, huge weight um, uh, through gravity on top of these hills. So animals do not prefer going like that. And so this has resulted in a fragmentation in this area. Now, apart from habitat fragmentation, we also find another uh, phenomenon, which is known as habitat displacement. Now, habitat displacement is the shifting of wildlife to non-prime or subprime habitats, such as hills or rocky patches. Now, what is habitat displacement? Now, typically, if you go to any grassland area that is uh, uh, near uh, a forested area and if you find that people are taking their cattle into these grasslands and if you ask these people that oh your cattle are uh, out competing the wildlife they would normally say oh no sir this is uh, not the case because our cattle uh, graze in these grasslands whereas the wild animals live on top of the hills now if you think about it logically the wild animals do not live on top of the hills because the wild animals also require the same resources they also require access to the same grasses, the same fodder, the same water that is being used by the cattle. But then because of a tremendous competition with the cattle, because together with the cattle, there will be humans who will be going in, into these areas with their lattes and probably they will also be taking a few dogs. And so the animals have been displaced out of these grasslands. So these animals do not have any other place to live than the top of the hills. So the animals have been shifted from their prime habitats to a non-prime or sub-prime habitat. Now why are uh, these uh, hilly areas non-prime or sub-prime habitats? Because they do not have 
a sufficient amount of uh, fodder they do not have a sufficient amount of water and so they are subprime habitats and in this process of habitat displacement the the wildlife has been shifted from a prime habitat to a subprime habitat such as hilly or rocky patches and because these subprime habitats do not have sufficient amount of food and water and other resources for the animals so slowly and steadily then uh, the the population of the wildlife will go on decreasing because the habitat does not have sufficient animal capacity so these are all different threats to the species so we looked at the large population dynamics we looked at the small population dynamics and we looked at processes of habitat degradation habitat loss habitat fragmentation habitat displacement and so on so these are all the threats that our wildlife are facing these days so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind